Ma, what are they giving me? It's going off with Rap Critic and Muse. I swear to God, like technology is the worst, especially when you're doing stuff live. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I can't stand that shit. I'm trying to do these live streams and it's like, oh, oh the video game is just not playing. What? What? I, I gotta go over here and just turn this off and turn it back on again and it was gonna be fine. Everything else I did meant nothing. I just had to do this one thing over here where I just turned this thing off and on and it was gonna be, like literally, there's one thing on, on my PS4 where like, it will not play with the Elgato, whatever the heck connection is, unless you uh, go to the PS4, go to settings and click through a specific thing that says enable HDCI code or something. And I'm like, what? How would anyone know that? <laughs> Ain't it always the way. <laughs> it's always something. Speaking of which, so we got two album requests this week, and if there's an album that you would like to hear our thoughts on, head on over to our Kofi, that is ko-fi.com slash going off. That's G-O-I-N-O-F-F. And you can request an album to be reviewed on a future episode of the show. I've got the fan house still popping Ooh. off with the daily or as close to daily as I can manage. Mm. Uh, Kids Bop reaction videos, and uh, so got Rift Break and Rift Comms, a couple big projects I'm currently working on. You, of course, got your uh, YouTube and the Rap Critic Reviews, yep, I, and I, your I, aforementioned streams. Yep, uh, twitch.tv slash Rap Critical, where we go through the uh, Billboard streams. We're on 2009 right now. By the time you uh, hear this episode, we're probably going to be on uh, 2010. So I, I like going through the Billboard Top 100, and you know, every now and then I do like my own list. Like uh, People can request uh, a best of an artist, or like request me to listen to an album on the stream, and I'll be doing like... So I'll, I'll double an episode to be like, hey, here's one... Uh, stream request and then one of you know thing that i want to listen to so i right now it people haven't been noticing it probably but because i do it so like sporadically but i've been going through the wu-tang clan and doing like the best of like their stuff so i went through like you know the jizza the rizza uh, i think uh uh Raekwon I just did and Method Man I just did with BTS because someone requested BTS so yeah if you see stuff like Method Man and BTS best of next to each other why, why that it's like look that's what they requested and this is that this is the artist I just happened to be in the middle of uh <laughs> you know wanting to do my my side of the thing on so yeah get what act like you want on twitch.tv slash rap critical and of course patreon.com slash rap critic where we've got our uh, uh where you get to see episodes early for two dollars uh, and get to join the rap Critic Discord, as well as uh, for the five dollar pledge, you get to leave a comment on what a song I'm reviewing. And if I like your comment, then I'll read it in my next episode. I've actually got a couple of good ones for the next song we're going to be reviewing that Jack Harlow joint. Oh boy, <laughs> so we're going to be getting into that one. I'm trying to reach a 350 uh, patron subscribers, and then I'll get started on that 1989 uh, best and worst of list. And then you know, if we get up to uh, 400 subscribers, then I'll do the 1990, like best and worst rap songs of 1990 and so on. So yeah, get what it act like you want it. That's what I'm doing over on my corner of the internet. <laughs> so like I mentioned before, we got two requests. I imagine we're going to go with the older one first. That makes the most sense. Sure, sure, yeah. So that's Marianne Faithful, Broken English, requested by Debu. This is the 1979 revitalization of Marion Faithful's career, essentially, after kind of going away for quite a while. I don't know much about her. Who, like, was she part of a group? No, she was a solo artist, um, primarily mid to late 60s. I'm honestly not too familiar with her work either. Um, for better or worse, she was more well-known in the 60s as being Mick Jagger's girlfriend. Interesting. And they had their own, you know, tabloid 60s ah, British yeah. pop yeah. drama going on. Yeah, goes. Uh, they famously broke up. Marion Faithful uh, didn't take it very well, took it very hard, ended up addicted to a couple substances, and lived pretty rough for a while, and wasn't really sure what was going on. But fast forward to 1979, a producer was willing to take a chance and work with Marianne, who had was pretty obscure by this point, because it's been like over 15 years since anyone's really like known what she's been doing. She had an album come out three years prior to this, but like it didn't do anything. Um, so people just kind of assumed she was done. The producer, I don't know if they were well known or not, but like 
kind of wanted to make a name for himself. Mm. And sometimes people just will kind of take a chance. Like, remember when we talked about the Vanilla Ice album? Yeah. At that point, the producer had already worked with, like, Korn and, like, really big names. Uh, he wants so a he challenge. was already in demand. Yeah. <laughs> but he was like, Vanilla Ice wants to make a, a fucking new metal record because he likes my work? No one else wants to do it? Sure, why not? I'll fucking do it. Why not? If nothing else, you get the press. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because, like, I was kind of getting the feeling as I was listening to it. R remember that uh, Warren Zevon album we listened to where it's just like, is this a guy who was, like, known for something at a specific period of time? And, right. Yeah, time has gone by, and it kind of feels like they're trying to catch up with new things. Because it's an interesting thing to listen to. Like, this is 1979, so it's like, yeah. it's not quite the 80s yet, but you can hear those synths in there. Like It's starting. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, like, they're, they're not confident synths yet. They're just like, oh. Oh, we're, we're, look, we're just putting this in the background here. Is, is that uh, is that cool? Is that is that okay? Is everybody okay with this? You know, like that's what it so sounds like. And yeah, the singer, like she's so. It was so interesting because yeah, I got that feeling of like, was this person from another era? And like, because the songwriting, it just doesn't quite feel right with this era of instruments. And I think it's just because the songwriting up to this point that I'm used to with this sound is a little bit more complex, you know what I'm saying? And so like something feels kind of jarring like listening to this. I, I noticed that, it's, so it's fascinating that you're bringing that up. It's interesting that that was the, that that was the uh, criticism and takeaway because uh, she had performed Broken English on uh, Saturday Night Live to promote the album. Huh. And I'd never seen it, but apparently it's like, it at least was considered to be one of the worst oh. SNL performances. Oh. And then it was just kind of a shit show. Oh no. And I think it's very weird that she ended up on SNL, especially after being away for so long. Yeah. Because what I didn't really know, because I'm not too familiar with her 60s work, the voice you hear on the record is a product of laryngitis oh. and drug abuse. That's why it's a bit cracky, a bit damaged. But I but will say her I think voice, it adds flavor and character. Yeah, her for voice. Sure has the most character out of everything that's yeah. happening on this album. And, and so honestly, as I was listening to it, I immediately was like, wow, this is a very interesting voice. It's so interesting to hear the emotion that she brings out of it. But the songs themselves, like the sum of their whole parts, from song to song, I kind of have to say I wasn't really feeling it that much. Which songs uh, were your favorites out of this? The Ballad of Lucy Jordan was interesting to listen to. Um... And uh, why'd you do it? The, the last one that's just insane. God, we got to get to why'd you do it, of course, yeah. And the cover for Working Class Hero was absolutely stellar. God Like, I was damn. like, okay, I get it now. I'm here for this. <laughs> Look, it definitely did hit you with the, the proverbial one-two punch at the very end. Yeah, right? Hitting you with, like, the hardest fucking songs on the whole album. Everything kind of feels like it's leading up to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm just going to go ahead and say from what you've said about it so far, I think I might have enjoyed this a little bit more than you did. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Some of these songs hit me a little bit harder than others, mm. for sure. The title track ha and the first track is kind of the weakest on the album, in my opinion. Yeah, I was like, nice voice. What is this? What am I? <laughs> yeah, um, I had to quote this because I certainly didn't get this from the song itself. Uh, the song's lyrical theme revolves around terrorism. The inspiration behind the song was, and I cannot pronounce this, it's a German name, um, Ulrich Meinhof, a co-founder of the terrorist group uh, Bader Meinhof Gang. Faithful allegedly got the idea for the song after watching a documentary about the group and was intrigued by its uh, by the subtitle Broken English, Spoken English. That's what track one is about. You, yeah, that's what I'm led to believe. <laughs> that's what I read and copied and pasted into my notes. It's, I didn't get that from the, yeah. you know, from the material itself. Like the ver yeah, like the verse is like, lose your father, your husband, your mother, your children. What are you dying for? It's not my reality. And then the hook is, it's just an old war, not even a cold war. Don't say it in Russian. Don't say it in German. Say it in broken English. And I'm like, I 
don't understand the significance of saying it in broken English. I could assume it's it's about war from the subtext. Yeah. But I don't know about what specifically. The writing is not very, uh, it, it doesn't pull you in the moment. Uh, I'll say that much. I think I was more interested in the instrumentation more than the vocals or the lyrics. The mm. subdued disco beat where like, yeah. <laughs> you put it best that it's 1979. <laughs> right. We're not quite in the 80s yet. It's disco cross-fading into in, New Wave. New Wave, yep, that's exactly it, yeah. <laughs> they know what they're getting at. They know where they're trying to go, right. but they're still bogged down with the disco right. mentality. Like, like they heard a, a Devo song, and they're like, hmm, those guys might be onto something, but let's not go crazy, <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> that, that might not necessarily be the future, and we don't want, like, a gimmick out here. So... <laughs> Witch's Song I thought was a good one. It's called Witch's Song, and I'm listening to it, and it so just sounds like a conventional late 70s folk rock tune, you know, like... I couldn't help but be reminded of uh, Stevie Nicks. Yes, yes, most definitely. With the talk of witches and whatnot, yeah, and also yeah, and the vibe, yeah. Marianne's kind of cracking voice kind of Absolutely. reminded me of uh, Stevie Nicks a little bit here. Yeah. I loved the instrumental on this one, though. This one sounded great. But I think that's what, maybe that's what got me, because it's like, I've heard so much good Fleetwood Mac and Stevie Nicks that as I'm hearing this, all I can think is, I could just get my fix from that Stevie Nicks, you know, like. <laughs> Danger is great joy. Dark is bright as fire. Happy is our family. Lonely is the ward. I just thought that sounded so dope. I don't know what it means, right. but it was just like, ooh, like, oh, I like that, okay. though. Yeah. Then Brain Drain is the song about drug addiction that we were going to get at least one. She flips it around. She goes, you're a brain drain. And then halfway through the hook, she goes, you're a drain brain. And I'm like, I don't know why she did that. Because I, oh, yeah, I don't know. Because yeah, I thought she said train brain the second time. And I was like, what? What's going on? And it's like, oh, she just flipped the words. What is that? What's it? Why? <laughs> like I liked the rhyme. You're a brain drain. You go on and on yeah, like a blood stain. That, that's a good hook. Like it definitely catches yeah. you. But I did like the light bluesy riffing going on on this one. Like yeah, this one had uh, some personality that I felt like I didn't get as much of in the in the first two tracks. I loved the instrumental for sure. That sounded dope as hell. Yeah. How did you feel about guilt? I thought it was uh, haunting. I like the bluesy approach. The instrumental was more at, more interesting to me and attention grabbing than the lyrics or the vocals. I like the it synth a, guitar that kind of comes in the second half of the track. You notice that? Like, yeah, when the synths and saxophone join the party yeah, randomly. Yeah, adds a color to it. I was like, it. ooh. <laughs> the production on the drums, they sound so fucking good. Like, they're so clear and very, like loud very in your face i like the sound of the drums then you mentioned the ballad of lucy jordan this was the first cover of the album um uh. originally by what was the name shell silverstein oh wow a folk artist <laughs> yeah and the poet i used to read his stuff all the time and this song is about a woman i guess she she's tired of the suburban life and and she's like you know there must be more to this provincial lot you know what i'm saying like that's her that's her whole thing but i, I was just kind of having a hard time trying to figure it out there was something that felt like it was talking about a, a like a young girl and then with the hook was like at the age of 37 it just made me go like oh the more Morning sun touched lightly on the eyes of Lucy Jordan in a white suburban bedroom in a white suburban town as she uh, lay there neath the covers, dreaming of a thousand lovers to the world told her. I think maybe there's just something about that lyric that made me feel like, oh, this must be a young girl thinking about what her life will be. Yeah, it's like the fantasizing of what could be. Yeah, and so I'm thinking like, oh, instead it's just someone who, who has a husband, but yeah, yeah, she's fantasizing about the better life that she could have lived up to this point, right? You know, I did like how in the verses it kind of gets you to know like the mundaneness of her life right like the kids are off to school and her husband's off to work and there are oh so many ways for her to spend the day she can clean the house for hours or rearrange the flowers or run naked through the shady streets screaming all the way <laughs> she could just continue to be along with this and not question it or she can you know allow the madness to drive her insane <laughs> the song ends in a way that Marianne like interpreted entirely differently which I think is fascinating uh, yeah, where yeah I saw that yeah Lucy Jordan ends up on the roof of the house and the lyrics mention like a, uh, like a man in a white jacket or coat like r reaches his hand out yeah. or something. And originally the implication uh, was that Lucy ends up jumping off the roof, but 
Marianne interpreted it that she was saved and taken to a mental hospital. Right. Yeah, it was the original song by a dude, and she was like, "God damn it! Why do women have to die in these songs?" No. It- <laughs> I mean, probably. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Another one where I really liked the choppy synths. They knew what they were fucking doing with the synths, man. Mm. Like. Yo, oh, they were. Uh, uh, that producer was having some fun. What's the hurry? Was another one I, I was kind of lukewarm. Yeah. On. Again, I was like, I like her voice. I'm just not enthused about this music. <laughs> like. I thought the instrumental was really good on that one. Yeah. Um, I like the bass and the guitar and everything on that, but the lyrics weren't interesting, and it was just kind of short. But goddamn working class Ooh, hero. Yeah, Look, that was man. a hit. I, it was. You know, when something's good, where you have that feeling of like, wait. Is this the original? Goddamn! Like <laughs> she fucking made it her own, right? <laughs> but her personality and her energy on this yeah, really I'm- fucking made it. I've heard three versions of this: uh, the Lennon original, the Marianne Faithful cover, and a Green Day cover. Uh, and right. I'm convinced that no one can do a bad working class yeah. hero. It's written in such a way right. that it's it's delivered almost just like speaking. You don't even necessarily have to sing it. So yeah. there's no wrong way to like deliver it. And with the way the music It's very simple. The rhythm of the music and how it's kind of like it, it allows for that plaintive, you know, um sophic style of writing. You know what I'm trying to say? Like which is like line through line and like this is what this is and this is what this is. Except it's like three lines at a time, I think. Every lyric, oh my god, it's just so good. It's so good. It takes you through the whole fucking story. Like as soon as you're born, they make you feel small by giving you no time instead of it all till the pain is so big you feel nothing at all. Like, god damn like the first lyric out you're just like oh oh uh, oh damn oh no this is too real <laughs> like it's such a timeless song yeah too. like how does this song not cause like a crisis in capitalism I, I <laughs> like, know everyone hearing this and just going like oh my god this is what we're doing <laughs> you know holy shit yeah. it spells it out so plainly oh my god they hurt you at home and they hit you at school they hate you if you're clever and they despise a fool till you're so fucking crazy you can't follow their rules I was surprised by yeah. just the language of how they spoke I was like wait that was it because I looked up the original lyrics I was like oh he says it like that in it too what damn they just <laughs> like you know they just, for it. Yeah, like, it just feels like I didn't think they started speaking like this till like the 90s <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, no one said fuck until 1991 yeah, <laughs> then the fucking shit hits the fucking why fan in the best it? way oh my god why do you do it I couldn't take it I was like whoa what's happening <laughs> Why, why'd you do it? She said, why'd you let her suck your cock? I'm like, oh, oh I, I don't know, baby. I don't know. <laughs> I had a couple of margaritas and it was in the moment. <laughs> I was working late. <laughs> so fucking, it goes for the throat so fucking it's hard. So it's so re- damn intense. It's one of the most like, quote, quote unquote, woman scorned anthems. Oh, like, right. wow. Uh, fucking Alana, proto Alanis Morissette set over here. <laughs> With this fucking Patty Smith energy on this too, the biting delivery yeah. on the lines, it sounds so personal. And I don't even know if she wrote it exclusively to make that makes it even wilder. <laughs> it that, like, like, yeah. <laughs> this lyric right here, why'd you do it? She said, when you know it makes me sore. Cause she had cobwebs up her fanny and I believe in giving to the poor. Why'd you do it? Wow. She said, why'd you spit on my snatch? <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> Again, 79, it's surreal. Yeah, I was like, oh. <laughs> What'd you give this overall? I gave it a four. <sighs> I gave it a th- <laughs> I know. I gave it a three and a half. I, 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 I oh, just, okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, not, not bad necessarily. Like, this clearly artistry and whatnot that you, that you got to recognize here. But yeah, it just doesn't equal the sum of its parts to me. Like, even with the experimentation and her unique voice, it just feels like there needs to be a little bit more oomph here. And like I said, I'm sorry. I've heard Fleetwood Mac a lot already. I, I can't help but compare and feel like mm, this. I'm, I'm left wanting. You know what I mean? There's a lot of things this album reminds me of. And the things it reminds me of does what this album does better. Right. It's like if this had something unique, like other than that, it could pull me, but it's just not enough, you know? Moving on, we got Dr. Goatman coming on through. Once again. Requesting a moon shaped pool by Radiohead. RC, it's been a while. Yeah. We talked about In Rainbows quite a while ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, how'd you feel about this one? 
I did not feel it that much. I got to just go out and say, I am so sorry. I like, don't blame you at all, I was, honestly. I was listening to this. I was like, all right, what are they going to get going? At? Like, all right, this is not like this is nice, respectable art music that they're making. But like, I'm not invested anytime I hear any of these tracks. Like, I'm OK with it being abstract, too. But like, I still need to feel something like there's some of these songs where it's like, I get that this is about love, but I don't feel that this is a song about love. You know what I'm saying? Like, it just feels like they're too caught up in the heads of let's do this thing that sounds experimental. And look, we're putting a whole bunch of cellos in the street. And I'm like, OK, but what is this song about? Like, why should I listen to this song? It is nice that this sounds like this, but where are we going with it? And, and I had seen that this came out in 2016. I was like, oh, so this is like way later in their career. And it's like, I feel like these motherfuckers just ain't hungry. I, it sounds to me like they're just throwing stuff at the wall and just kind of experimenting and just kind of doing something. And it's like, and that's nice. That's fine for you if that's how you feel. I'm a fan of gorillas, right? Like I like listening to gorillas. I'm a fan of the melancholic, uh, sad, you know, British boy. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm about it when it comes to gorillas, but when I hear gorillas and Damon Albarn, like, each song sounds different. Each song sounds like he's going for a different timbre. He sings different ways. Hell, they sing it this way and what? And then next he'll be singing this way. You know, like, he gives you a lot, Damon Almar does. And when I hear this, I hear like, oh, this is Damon Almar. But if it's just like a band trying to do this specific sound, and it's like, that is so boring. And but the thing is, like, I listen to Blur songs and I don't get this feeling, right? Like, you know, and I know they're very different bands. They're going for different things. But, like, I just couldn't help but feel like, no, I do like a British, you know, crooner, you know, uh, getting this sad boy on. But, like, this is just not giving me enough color for it to hit for me like song after song i just kept feet i just kept writing down nice epic respectable music but i'm not invested it's it feels like running in place music like it, it's just kind of like it stay it starts at this place where it's like ding 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 and maybe we'll add something on top of it it was like oh my god can we go somewhere can we go somewhere can we go somewhere like i I just couldn't help but feel like I was looking. It's like it's just maintaining the same thing. It's like yes, epic and respectable, but do something, <laughs> pull an emotion out of me. You know, the musicality is there, but I, I'm not getting where I'm supposed to relate to this as a human being listening to music that's supposed to be pulling my emotions. You know, I think you know what I'm about to say. Uh, you absolutely loved it. Five out of five. <laughs> you a hater, rap critic? <laughs> <laughs> Nutting those exact words. <laughs> no, um, I definitely really enjoyed this, though. Uh, I couldn't give it a five, though. Absolutely could not do that. If you were to listen to some of the things I listened to, mm. uh, you'd think it's boring as shit. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Some stuff is for a certain mood, right? Like In my experience with this album, uh, Tom York and the vocals, like Marianne Faithful did kind of take a back seat mm. in my experience to the instrumentals, which I liked a lot more. Um, for those who aren't aware or didn't read or whatever, um, this is about Tom York's breakup with his 23 year long partner. That's what I read at some point and I was like, wow, I didn't get a feeling of like intense heartbreak at all. I got a feeling of very contemplated, hmm, I seem to have been in a breakup. Uh, wow, I guess I wouldn't yeah, allow me to emo process these emotions. <laughs> Daydreaming, and especially the last one where he is straight up begging for this person not to go. I like the daydream. Is some of yeah. the most some of the most heart-wrenching stuff, especially the last one. Yeah, that um, one was cool. Love yeah, Waste. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, Fucking hell, that song, man. Those, the two you just mentioned were the ones I felt had the best music in them. Yeah, like that uh, helped pull at that emotion the most for me. I also gave a really high rating to Full Stop. Those were my three favorite songs. Uh, oh, um... Uh -oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that realization did not sound promising. I guess the first thing I wrote was like, "Are we gonna rock even like a little bit?" Oh, okay, I guess we're getting something. Uh, like, spoiler alert: No, yeah. not really. <laughs> the first song is as rocking as you're gonna get. Yeah. Um, Burn the Witch was the big radio hit single. 
that hyped up and got everyone's hopes up for the album that they didn't end up getting. So after that, if you're asking, when does this album rock? When does this album go somewhere? Uh, you're going to be waiting yeah. a while. Don't hold your breath. And I'm not saying shit has to sound like fucking corn for me to yeah. respect this rock music, right? But it's like, because like I said, like I, I'm cool with listening to some gorillas and you know weird down tempo stuff, but it just doesn't stretch like enough for me to really feel like it's, I don't know, man. Like Desert Island Disc in, in particular. Like this was like, oh, this is Desert Island music. This is the music. I, like, I guess you need something to put you to sleep to not think about the fact that you're by yourself on an island, I guess. Like, you know? Well, that one was kind of boring. <laughs> for me it was too mellow yeah like this is the desert island disc huh (laughs) Uh, the lowest rating i actually gave was to present tense uh, which was towards the end here this was by the time it became tropey to me right where where i I started off hearing the light guitar and i was like ooh. Oh, that sounds a little nice. Oh, we're going. Here's a new bit of color and texture. And then I started hearing the ooh, ooh, and it just it just brought me back down. Like it was just like mm. there was a little bit of a different color going on. I was like, okay, we're going in a new direction. And then just the no. Remember, we're doing very boring sounding New Age Gregorian chant music. And I was just like. Uh, okay <laughs> you know like it's just so that's what i wrote like it's so formless and aimless a lot of these tracks that i'm mm. just not intrigued enough to be mentally invested like i am sorry like i heard some lyrics on this and i was like i think that's something but then i get to one song and it'll be like half of the song is just like one repeated phrase and i'm like come on man yeah <laughs> um, there was one song in particular which one was that identikit yeah. Where it, it, it repeats, um, broken heart, uh, make it rain, broken hearts, make it rain. See, this is the thing, though, that would have gotten really annoying to me if every time he said it, it didn't sound different. Like mm. he's he says it with a different inflection every time. And eventually it gets replaced with like a choir saying it and yeah. synths are coming in in the background. That kept it interesting for me. Yeah. And, and now, I like the musicality that was going on behind it, where it's like there was a guitar that was playing that it was playing in such a way that it, it just felt to me like the rain being swept by the wind going past your window or something like that. Like there was something about the guitar that hit in a perfect way that was like, ooh, I'm getting a texture. I'm getting a specific color that I can pull out and be like, yo, I might want to go back to the song again because this song is getting giving me something that is this instead of all of this is like this is collectively very well put together uh unengaging music you know like it, it's absolute music it, it feels like music for its own sake after a certain point I, i'll be honest like i will agree with you to the extent that for an album that completely and almost exclusively uh deals with one man's heartbreaking experience I don't think it really takes into account the listener. I think this is very therapeutic and cathartic for Tom. And it's like, that's great, but like, like that is great that you have made this piece of music that you really care about. And I hope it helps, yeah, you right, know? Like, like, I hope this felt good to do. Yeah, but like, we've listened to Break Up Albums before. Who's that one uh, motherfucker? We're gonna drive uh, to California to try to, you know, make this thing work, and oh my There's God. the Mountain Goats. Yes, that's who it was, yep, yep, yep. So you know what I'm talking about, so like, you know, like, I, I want to hear, I want to be taken on a journey. It felt like for this, I, you know, for that album, it felt like he's showing me everything. And for this album, I feel like he's got his fucking palm closed and I got to fucking jerk his hand open and say, what, 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 what are you talking about? What are you dealing with over there? <laughs> what do you got in there? Yeah. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> it's like, I mean, I guess if you don't care for me to check it out, that's fine. But I, I wanted to, <laughs> like, you know. I think another thing I really should try to do with albums going forward. I don't know if this necessarily would have helped in your situation, but I did get bored by the end. It is like, it is almost an hour, I think. It's like 50 minutes or something like that. I wonder if I listened to it in chunks and not in one sitting, if that would change my uh, opinion on it. Like if I just kind of heard songs maybe on shuffle, like... I mean, some of them go into each other, so maybe that might not work. But uh, what I'm trying to say here is how I would describe it, not so much as an album, but as like a collection of songs overall for like to the listener. Mm, A mood suite. (laughs) Yeah. And like someone who's listening 
two hour review to get our opinion to be like should i listen to this like very rarely do i think people listen to albums completely in full sitting with absolutely nothing else going on no distraction um and that's how i'm doing it just sitting here taking notes and this has my undivided attention and i'm like yeah i don't know if that would work for everybody man but there's some songs on here that i think might just kind of out of context. Uh, I will say Dex Dark. I, I thought that was one of my favorite joints just because like, you know, you, you're listening to it. You're like, oh, my God, is this about an alien invasion? <laughs> like, I, I do like how a lot of the songs, they deal with the breakup, but they don't talk about the breakup. They use like metaphors and th different things. This feels so British. This is so like, yeah. I'm going through emotions, but oh, I, I mustn't be too forthright about it because that would be unbecoming of a, of a you know, like, <laughs> I, I was just uh, actually listening to this podcast where they're talking about uh, turning of the, the turning of the screw. And it's a, a book that I had never like read before, but you know, it's one of those like, oh yeah, I know like this horror movie is kind of like the others. I think it's kind of based off of it. You know what I mean? And it's one of those things where like the book is set in like, uh, not Victorian time, like the late 1800s, but like in Britain and the idea is like you know there's a school uh, this woman or nanny taking care of these two children and like there's a haunting of ghosts or something like that that's going on because we're in this so polite society where we can't just go what's wrong with you hey wait a minute are you doing this is someone hurting you is someone touching you you know it has to be like well you you must be like this now so if there was something like this well don't do that you know what i mean and it's like like uh what is it that i think like one of the boys was saying something where it's just like oh yes uh i seem to like this girl and i'm going to you know, uh, go over to her place uh, a lot of times, and do, and we're going to have lots of time. And this is like, okay, you're clearly talking about sex, but you can't say that. So, like me in this modern age, reading that, I like if I don't have the context, and I'm just like, well, people just say what they mean, and I'm reading this, I'm like. What, what are you talking about? Are you just hanging out with her? Are you, are you fucking or not, <laughs> you know? But back then it would be like, oh my, they can't say that so we know what they mean, you know? And so it's like, that's what I kind of get with this where it's like, oh man, I have these emotions and feelings, but it's still quite unbecoming to just, you know, lay them out like that. N not necessarily because someone's gonna reprimand you, but because of, you know, at this point with the way that British society has gone, like these rules are just in your brain to this point where it's all mental, right? And so it's like having to undo that, but still dealing with the reality of, I can't just be forthright with my emotions, you know? And so so in that way, I can appreciate it a little bit. Um, but there is still that level of just like, let it out, man. You'll feel better. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. It, it's why I think the songs where he is very upfront about it and just like not in a Robin Thick kind of way <laughs> begging right. or, or or maybe even worse in a Kanye kind of way. Oh, Lord. Begging <laughs> someone who's leaving to take them back or not leave like he's very sympathetic on this record you feel for him you give him i'll give him this he yeah he doesn't do it in that way that makes you go like yeah with kanye where it feels gross you're like dude come on in public show some re show some self-respect <laughs> you know i'm not embarrassed for tom <laughs> yeah. listening to this I, i'm just like i'm just sitting here like Fuck, man, this sucks. I like the cool rotating piano line uh, that goes throughout the song, and then just the first line. I, I like it sometimes when people start with like stuff that sounds like it's in the middle of sentences when they're doing it right. You know, that makes you like, oh shit, we just woke up in the story. So I kind of like, yeah, where he goes like, then into your life, cause there comes the darkness, and there's a spacecraft blocking out the sky, and there's nowhere to hide, and you run to the back and you cover your ears, like just automatically putting you in that, oh, oh, <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> fuck what we do now when you were talking about just the british the zeitgeist and all of that it made me think for example when you look at like monty python and it was like <laughs> oh you know there's like nudity on the show whatever yeah. and i'm thinking like man i just don't think we would have allowed that in the states like we're still mm. oddly puritan yeah when it comes to that stuff interesting um and just like nudity in general is just way more accepted and like British media, yeah, which true. is odd because you hear about other ways they're right. very aggressive. Like the and it's like, and the <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, like it's not across the board for sure. But what you reminded me of was recently I had heard that the song Salty Chocolate Balls, I assume you're familiar? <laughs> yes, by Chef. <laughs> by Chef from South Park. Yeah, you've heard of this, yes? Uh, I've seen this close. I've heard about this. <laughs> the song was released as a single. <laughs> and it reached number one on the UK singles chart. Fucking, isn't that uh, just a thing? Like, novelty songs will reach number one in the UK just because it's so fucking small of a country, you know? They do so well. And 
I was listening to a review of a wrestling special where Isaac Hayes showed up and performed chocolate salty balls <laughs> on the show. Incredible. The 90s. Wow. And the hosts of the show are Irish, I think. And they were talking about how, and they said it like it was, you know, so matter of fact, oh, you remember when Salty Chocolate Balls was all over the radio and you couldn't get away from it. <laughs> and I'm just like, on the radio? That's so insane to think. I was like, what the fuck? I can't even wrap my head around that. I could that. never imagine driving somewhere in the backseat, you know, with my mom in like 1999 no. or whatever. And hearing when my mom turned up, oh, this is the hit song on my chocolate salty. Oh, they did the disco mix. What are you about? <laughs> no way! <laughs> Incomprehensible. I also just found out it was produced by Rick Rubin, so... Uh, did they put TV uh, show themes on fucking uh, UK radio as well? Fuck, uh, nobody told you life was gonna be this way. <laughs> you know the Rembrandt's got some radio play. They had to have. <laughs> Because I had the album as a kid, I recently rebought the Chef Aid CD. Oh, nice. And I wasn't aware that it was released in three formats. You could get the clean version. Oh, Lord. Which, you know, self explanatory. Yeah, the stuff that your uh, aunt gets for you that you can go back to the, to the uh, store and get for the censored version, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the one you may have bought at Walmart or some yeah. shit by accident. Uh, then there was the explicit version. Then there was an extreme version. What? Do they add curse words? Like, just every now and then someone just says fuck in the middle of an instrumental break? Like The explicit version still had some light censoring. What? Uh, oh, wow. And I've never heard of that. Oh, was <laughs> like, it, is it like an Eminem situation where he's like, oh, I'd rather see presidents dead, and they're like, ooh, shit, we can't just have this. Oh, mm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, gotta cut that. <laughs> yeah, it was like some random shits and fucks would get bleeped. Too many shits. If they hear that many shits, the, the kids will have no choice but to say it. It's too many shits. <laughs> too, too many, many. shits. <laughs> too many shits. Too many shits. <laughs> I hate to put that on and randomly get, like, almost jump-scared by a censoring. Like, why would I think they would be here? It's a South Park CD. You're old, dirty bastard fucking going off. Yeah, you bitch, I'm gonna get you in it. I was like, wow, old, dirty bastard censored sounds even more unhinged. <laughs> Don't you ever try the psychology, my... <laughs> Never. Like, Mother... He, he, like, what? What are they doing? He, he genuinely sounds like someone who's going on a tear, but is like, you know, slightly like uh, uh, nodding off on the quaaludes. So he's like <laughs> yeah. going on his rant, but his then he's, he's falling up. asleep. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you ever try... <laughs> psychology, my... Mother... <laughs> Man, I'm glad I brought that up because we're, we're, we're running kind of short anyway. But um, ultimately, I ran away with another four. How about you? Uh, I gave it a three. Um, I, I'm sorry, folks. I know respectable band and I'm supposed to automatically like them. I know, but I, I'm sorry. I can't. I, I can't act like I'm not hearing what my ears are telling me that I'm hearing, you know? And it's like, you know, I talk to my ears like, oh, word, is that what you're hearing? Yeah, that's what you're hearing. Do you like that? I can't act like I do. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the that's conversation I got to have with my ears, you know? So I, I got to be honest with y'all, you know what I mean? This one, from what I gather, was sort of divisive. Yeah, I mean, like I said, as soon as I saw it was from 2016, I'm like, oh, okay, this isn't like, oh, 1998, oh, yeah, of course, this was the smash that everyone's talking about. You know, this is like the, oh, they're a legacy band at this point, let's hear what they've got now, you know. They can really do whatever they want. Right, right, <laughs> like, right. No one's going to tell Tom York or Radiohead not to, you know, put something out. Oh, come on, the, the rock radio fans don't want to hear this. <laughs> Get back in that studio and make a fucking, uh, what the hell's the name of that group that made the Thunder song? Imagine Dragons. Yeah, yeah, go back and imagine some ex-ambassadors or some shit. <laughs> oh, God, fucking... Thunder has got to be in the top three worst songs I've ever the heard in my entire fucking life. not rock song of all fucking it's time. It's so obnoxious, thunder, too, with the fucking yeah, thunder, pitching. Uh, fake drum sound. Uh, it's like, uh, stop! Uh, it's so... I hate it. It is insulting. Like, I'm not even, like, ride or die for rock music like that. And even I'm looking over there like... 
man, y'all gotta feel, y'all gotta feel disrespected by this one. <laughs> you know, like I've never liked Imagine Dragons, but that one, fucking hell, that one takes the cake. It's uh, like above and beyond. Yeah, but radioactive. I'm like, no oh, way. Yeah. This was the same group. <laughs> like, yeah. When I saw Todd, this I remember watching Todd the Shadows review and being like, you know, they're talking about that song and then the count, counting stars song or something like that. I think it, oh yeah. Yeah, because I think he might have put that, that was okay. Yeah, he put the other one on like his best of list or something like that. And I remember like, well, who is this group? Who are these guys? Wow, maybe I should give them a chair. Oh. And then the, the other songs started becoming hits, and I was like, oh. Same guys? Okay, no more. Oh, no, I'm good. False alarm. <laughs> <laughs> you can have all of that. <laughs> but for the show, for going off show, that's what we're calling it now. Yeah. Going off the show. The going off show. Oh my god. I'm sorry, there's this quick lyric from Desert Island Disc where I just remember where it just goes like this is the first lyric he goes, Now as I go upon my way, so let me go. Dot dot dot. Upon my way. <laughs> born of light, born of light. I remember just being like Dude, what are you, where is this going? <laughs> Why are you just saying the same thing? <laughs> You're trying to make someone feel bad. So it's just like, all right, that's fine. I'll just go to the party myself. Yeah. I'm going to the party right now. Going by on myself. My way. Yeah. You know, you know, talk to talking to myself at the party with a cup all alone, I guess. Uh, if you're not coming, <laughs> I'm going by myself, you know. everyone. <laughs> Bet you feel real shitty now. Wish you would. No. What? That about wraps it up for. It's just called going off. The name of the podcast is going off. And don't you forget it. I feel like I gotta be like fucking David Byrne. Starting the fucking concerts. The name of the band is Talking Heads. There's no the. Uh, you know? Yeah. Socials, we did it. Plugs, Word. we did them already. Professional um, internet people. Yeah. For going off, <laughs> I'm Muse. <laughs> and I'm Rav Critic. And hey, uh, let's add in a, a third album review. Here's my uh, uh, first impression of uh, oh. listening to that Jack Harlow. Here, here we go. In the Ooh. <clears throat> oh. Oh no. That's my review. Good night, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so it's dull, huh? Yeah, yeah, pretty fucking dull. <laughs>